The community sits among the rolling foothills of the Allegheny Mountains, about 1,100 feet above sea level. It is not a small, nor a particularly large community. Roughly rectangular, it measures approximately four and a quarter miles on its longest north to south axis, slightly less than three miles east to west, a total area of 10 square miles. As of 1980, it was called home by slightly over 19,000 residents who owned 5,665 households with a median value of $91,800 per house. In terms of resident age, it is a young community. Some 33% of its residents are not yet 18 years old. Its neighbors, too, consider it young. To the north, Mount Lebanon and Scott Townships see it as the new upstart, taking the shine from their dominance as south of Pittsburgh suburbs. The even more rural Peters Township to the south sees it as yet another bedroom community for the metropolitan sprawl of Pittsburgh. But any label that refers to Upper St. Clair as new denies a history that predates the Revolutionary War. In terms of urban development, it may be true that Upper St. Clair is a relative newcomer. But in terms of heritage, it can be argued that the growth of Upper St. Clair parallels, in many ways, the history of our country. It is that heritage and that parallel we will investigate in the several St. Clairs, the history of a Pennsylvania township. The Western Pennsylvania region had settlers long before the arrival of the white man. The earliest known residents were the Alegui and Monongahela Indians, although they had disappeared leaving no recorded history by the time white traders arrived in the 1600s, burial grounds remained. A derivation of the Alegui name, for instance, identifies our modern Allegheny County. And in 1902, 1968, and 1978, burial grounds were excavated near Boyce Road in Upper St. Clair, the revealed remains of a Monongahela tribe nearly 700 years old. In early 1654, Iroquois Indians, ranging south from what is now New York, drove the Erie Indian tribe out of northwestern Pennsylvania, which left the area more or less open for the Iroquois domination of the lucrative trade in furs. This control continued into the 1720s when a number of the Shawnee and Delaware tribes, as well as Nanticokes and Conoys, were forced west into the relatively empty area around Pittsburgh by the expansion of white settlements to the east. Although these tribes were not particularly friendly to each other, they lived in relative peace under Iroquois dominance, and English traders managed to conduct trade with all of them throughout western Pennsylvania until the momentous occurrences of 1749. For it was during 1749 that the French marched east from the Ohio Valley to lay claim to the territory surrounding the so-called Forks of the Ohio. For the next nine years, the Indians were allies of the French, and the British were generally excluded from trade and travel in western Pennsylvania. It should be noted that the Indian population of Pennsylvania was never as large as the more mythic historical tales might lead us to believe. At their peak, there were no more than 20,000 Indians in the entire state. By 1763, Western migration had reduced the population to 5,000, by 1776 to 1,000. The Indians briefly united with English troops when, under General Forbes, they captured Fort Duquesne on November 24, 1758. The shaky union ended in 1763 when the Indians turned on the British only to lose a decisive battle at Bushy Run. Many Indian survivors escaped west into Ohio, which left a gap that immediately resulted in a new flow of white settlers to the area. In fact, St. Clair's first known white settler arrived a year earlier. In 1762, one John Fife, a Scottish emigre, came from Winchester, Virginia into the area. Like many of the earlier settlers, he came from the south and over Chartier's Creek to settle, not over the mountain to the north that separated the Pittsburgh outpost from our township. He met with the local Indians at what is now the corner of Hayes and Lindenwood Roads, where his well can still be seen. He traded a pair of moccasins and a flintlock rifle for their goodwill and took possession of a grant of 1,000 acres of wooded, hilly farmland. 
In 1764, when Christian Lesnet arrived, he also took 1,000 acres, and the settlement of Upper St. Clair had begun. Lesnet left two sons on his land and walked back to Maryland that fall to gather the rest of his family. He didn't return until the next spring, but friendly Indians had cared for the boys and the family was happily reunited. Meanwhile, two colonies, Pennsylvania and Virginia, were disputing the ownership of the land. Settlers favored Virginia's claim, as they were selling land at 10 shillings, or about $2 per 100 acres. When the Penn family started to sell land in 1769, their price of 5 pounds per 100 acres was substantially higher. Thus, many early Upper St. Clair land grants were actually issued by the colony of Virginia. The dispute carried on until 1780, when Virginia finally released their claim to all points north of the Mason-Dixon line, leaving St. Clair to the Penns. Had Virginia won the claim to the territory, the future Upper St. Clair would have become part of Augusta County, Virginia, and today would probably be part of the state of West Virginia. Meanwhile, settlers continued to filter in. William Fife took 400 acres adjacent to his brother John's land in 1769. Alexander Gilfillan settled on 400 acres in 1770. His purchase arrangement was settled in 1785 at a price of 10 pounds per 100 acres. And in 1776, with the Revolutionary War in its second year, the Reverend John McMillan arrived to found two churches, Hill Church, well to the south, and Bethel Church, just east of present-day Upper St. Clair. He helped to organize more churches in later years. These churches became a religious center for many early settlers, and many of them made adjacent cemeteries their final resting place. Headstones for Fife, Gilfillan, Connor, and Phillips families from as early as 1799 are scattered throughout the Bethel Cemetery. Other now familiar names such as Morrow, Donaldson, McMillan, and McLaughlin can be found in Hill Church's graveyard. St. Clair residents, including four members of the Fife family, Espies and Gilfillans, served in the 4th Company during the latter part of the Revolutionary War. The elder Fife, a captain, led a 96-man company. All returned home safely in 1782. At this point, the area still had no official name other than being part of the large Washington County, which encompassed nearly all of southwestern Pennsylvania. It was not until September 24, 1788, that Allegheny County was separated from Washington County. The southernmost of seven townships was named after a controversial Scotsman and Ligonier resident who had served as the only Pennsylvania Major General in the Revolutionary Army. He acted as President of the Continental Congress in 1787 and as Governor of the Northwest Territory. Although Arthur St. Clair never actually owned land in the township, it took his name and has kept it ever since. In its original formation, the township was quite large, running from the Monongahela River in the north to Chartier's Creek in the Washington County line in the south. Despite the immense size and difficulty of travel, the only voting place in the township for the next 50 years would be at the south end of the Smithfield Street Bridge, on the other side of Mount Washington, far from most residents. Coincidentally, much of the lumber for this bridge was cut and sawed in Upper St. Clair. But before the township was reduced to a more manageable size, it provided the center ring for history of a different sort, the Whiskey Rebellion of 1794. By the 1790s, many of the farmers in St. Clair Township and elsewhere produced homemade whiskey, not only for their own consumption, but for sale and trade. Most used it as supplementary income to obtain other goods that they needed to farm their land. In 1793, a new revenue-raising excise tax was passed by the federal government. It established new taxes on all whiskey production and required producers to register their stills. Allegheny and Washington counties proved to be the least cooperative territory. Most whiskey here was used as barter, and since the new taxes were on a cash basis, many farmers could not meet the requirements since they dealt with very little cash from one year to the next. In 1794, writs were issued for non-registrants to pay cash fines. When a federal agent and General John Neville, the local tax collector, served the writs, protest broke out in earnest. A, con a confrontation at the Miller homestead, now in South Park, led Neville to retreat to his home, Bower Hill, while a group of angered farmers from our area and points south gathered at Couch's Fort, an old Indian era stockade named after Nathan Couch. The fort sat near where Lums and the Pioneer Inn have sat on Fort Couch Road. 
On July 16 and 17, 1794, despite the urgings of the Reverend John Clark to turn aside their anger, the rebels, as they were called, attacked Bower Hill and burned it to the ground. Neville escaped. The rebels' first leader, James McFarland, was mortally wounded, and the ultimately unsuccessful rebellion was underway. Although the final scenes of the short-lived rebellion shifted elsewhere, the roots of the discord were deep in St. Clair Township. In 1800, the township was reduced to 797 square miles in size, and was reduced again in 1806 when Alexander Gilfillan and others petitioned for a smaller township. As the map shows, nearly all early settlers created their own names for the land grants they farmed, from the straightforward Spring Hill and Fowler's Grove to Vale of Content and Gilead to the more colorful Ugly, Trouble Without Profit, and Difficulty. Although few of these names lasted out the century, their owners, Couch, Connor, Morrow, Morton, and others, have been remembered in street names and other landmarks. It was about this time that the oldest structures still visible today were built. The Phillips House on Seeger Road appeared in 1806. The Connor House on McMillan Road went up in the early 1800s. The Lesnet House on Old Lesnet Road was constructed as early as 1820. And in 1830, the Gilfillan family erected a log tenant farmer house along what is now McLaughlin Run Road. It has gone through several changes since, but thanks to the 1830 Log House Committee, it was returned to its original form in 1976 and is perhaps the community's most visible reminder of its past. In 1838, the Johnston family established a home on what is now Southview Drive. Like many other early structures, the bricks for the home were fired on the site, and the walls are 13 inches thick. One year later, St. Clair Township was further reduced in size when it was split into two sections, Lower and Upper St. Clair. Lower St. Clair eventually disappeared, becoming Crafton, Dormont, and other portions of the city of Pittsburgh. The 1839 version of Upper St. Clair included current-day Scott and Mount Lebanon townships, which were not formed until 1861 and 1912, respectively. The 1840s saw additional homes added to the area. The Will T. Fife home on Old Washington Road, which included a tunnel from the barn to the house, reputedly used later as part of the Underground Railroad to hide escaped slaves, was built in 1840. The John Williams house on North Highland Road was built in 1845 to 46. The Quigg house on North Highland Road, 1847 and the Borland House on Cook School Road in the early 1850s. In 1843, this church building, now a Methodist place of worship, appeared on the Fawcett property. An earlier church facility had been established in 1812. Many settlers of the early 1800s from this area are buried nearby. 1844 brought the first regular mail delivery to the area. It arrived every Saturday at the general store. The era from 1850 to 1900 brought subtle but significant changes to Upper St. Clair. Although the suburbanization of the area did not begin in earnest until the 1920s, the 50 years leading into the 20th century saw industry invading the area and the development of two distinct communities. By 1850, the town for the predominantly agricultural Upper St. Clair had already started to flourish at the intersection of Washington Road and McLaughlin Run. Although unnamed in its early years, the crossroads had gained the unfortunate nickname of Sodom, ironic because the farmers in the Whiskey Rebellion days had referred to the city of Pittsburgh by the same derogatory name. To remove this reference, the residents named the town Clifton, a name it maintained for many years. In this photograph, taken in 1920, the crossroads is clearly growing. At one time, it featured a general store and a post office in one building. Later came a school, blacksmith and wagon maker's shops, a tannery, a mill, tinners, and shoemaker's shops. For a time, the town of Clifton clearly acted as the central focus point of the still rural township. Like the rest of the country, though, Upper St. Clair interrupted its peaceful flow of life for participation in the Civil War during the 1860s. Captain Thomas Espy, a St. Clair landholder, organized a volunteer company, the St. Clair Guards. The Guards served honorably in many campaigns during 1861 and 1862, including the Battle for Gettysburg. Espy himself died of wounds suffered in the Battle of Gaines Mill, June 27, 1862. After the war, though, civilization continued to encroach on the once remote community. In the 1860s, mail was delivered twice a week. By 1878, it came daily, thanks to the railroads. 
In 1871, the Pittsburgh, Cincinnati, and St. Louis Railroad completed construction of its Chartiers branch, which passed through Boyce Farm on its way to Washington, Pennsylvania. The Boyce station included a general store and a post office, with a blacksmith shop nearby. The dairy farmers shipped their milk to town on the train, and communication and travel to the big city was simplified. More and more houses went up. The Gilfillan House near Washington Road, a 10-room structure built for $6,000 in 1857. The Hoffman House on McMillan in 1859. The James Fife House of 1870. The Caldwell House of 1878, which was raised in 1959. The Hoffman Second House, built on Fort Couch Road in 1880 and the DeMuth House, built in 1881. One house, a shop, and 13 lives were lost, however, in the Great Flood of Sunday, July 26, 1874. A cloudburst overwhelmed McLaughlin Run, and the McLeese family of five and their home were washed away. Clifton's blacksmith shop, including the anvil, also followed the torrent towards Bridgeville. But a whole new industry and a whole new town developed nine years later along another area waterway when William and Thomas Beedling opened the Harrison Coal Mine in 1883 on Painter's Run Road. That mine, also frequently called the Beedling Mine, and the smaller ones that followed it, such as Mayview, Mansfield, Panhandler, Witch Hazel, and Essen, changed the face of the northwestern corner of Upper St. Clair for the next 40 years. The town, of course, took the name of its founders, Beedling, and its chief mine alone once employed 300 people. Making use of a branch of the Pittsburgh, Chartiers, and Yakagini Railroad that ran to the mines along Painter's Run, the mines operated steadily until 1912. At that point, the Beedling mine was sold to the Pittsburgh Coal Company, which continued operations until 1923. The smaller mines closed. In 1910, the Upper St. Clair Hotel, now Walt's Tavern, was built across the street from the Beedling Mine. It is reported that the miners devised a method to signal ahead to the hotel near the end of the workday so that their refreshments could be waiting when they arrived. Beedling's lifestyle was clearly separate from the rural quality of Clifton. In its heyday, Beedling even supported its own band. One member of the band, who was also a miner for 55 years, starting at the age of 12 and a half, was Lawrence Hoffricker whose mining apparatus and tools have generously been donated to the community. According to one miner, though, work in the mines was not a year-round certainty. In the early 1900s, all coal was shipped on lakes, so when the lakes froze in the winter, there were no orders and no shipments. But when the orders were strong, miners worked eight hours a day, six days a week, with candles on their hats for illumination, finally replaced by battery-operated lamps. By the time the 20s were really roaring, though, the coal business of Beedling faded to nothing. And although mainly Beedling residents remained and turned to other tasks, the town slowly lost its boom population once its main industry disappeared. Many of the coal era houses and buildings, though, can be seen along Painter's Run and Rob Hollow Roads. One other Beedling fixture that remained, however, was Clara Hoffman, postmistress of this tiny post office which opened in 1917. Clara handled Beedling's mail for an amazing 36 years until the branch closed in 1953. The building now belongs to the Upper St. Clair Historical Society and a permanent home is being sought. As Beedling rose and fell in influence, the remainder of the community continued to advance. In 1897, a landmark appeared at the Lesnet Farm a hexagonal barn still clearly visible to passers-by. A year later, the Godwin family established their home and a greenhouse on Mayview Road, which now holds the distinction of being the oldest continuing business in the township. They also advertised being on the Bell phone system, which at the time allowed phone calls all the way into Pittsburgh, as opposed to the McMurray phone system, which at that time only connected Bridgeville and Clifton with the McMurray area. In the late 1800s, the township also began to develop an organized school system. In the earlier years, a landowner near the center of the student population would donate land for a school. When the center would shift, the land and building would revert to the landowner. 
In this manner, a school was built in 1835 for $270, in 1855 for $313, and in 1857 for $425. Ultimately, as community-controlled education grew, a numbered system was established for the six schools operating in the area. The Caldwell School, still standing at Johnston Road in Old Washington. The Clifton School, near the site of the current high school. The one-room Lesnet School. The second Cook School. The one-room Phillips School and the McMillan School, which serviced Beedling. All six operated until 1913, when teaching was centralized at Clifton and McMillan schools, and the other four schools were closed. Meanwhile, other aspects of township life became more and more citified. In 1901, rural free delivery of mail was established. Mail was distributed to individual homes, first from the Mansfield area, now called Carnegie, then from Bennett's Drugstore in Bridgeville. Bennett also made the carts used by the postman. The city lights began to beckon in 1909 when, on February 15, the first regular trolley car rail service to Pittsburgh began. As late as 1917, the fare was only six cents. From that moment on, and with the aid of the Liberty Tubes completed in 1928, Upper St. Clair slowly shifted from a rural agrarian society to the suburban community we know today. The first subdivisions, Brookside Farms and Willowbrook Farms, appeared in 1913 and 1915 respectively. However, though this may seem surprising to Upper St. Clair newcomers, the population of Upper St. Clair in 1940 was only 2,500. But as access to the city became easier and more reliable, growth followed. Population almost doubled between 1960 and 1970. Growth brought further inevitable alterations to the township. In the 1930s, Route 19 expanded to three lanes, irrevocably changing the nature of Clifton. The first gas station, an Esso facility, appeared there before 1938. In a field nearby, a TWA airplane flight crashed on March 26, 1937. All ten people aboard the plane, three crew members and seven passengers, died. A volunteer fire department was chartered in 1939 with 12 members. Then, in 1940, the community found need to hire its first full-time policeman, Jack Clancher, who served until 1952 and as police chief until 1971. The community had no jail, so on those occasions when an arrest was required, Mr. Clancher would handcuff the prisoner to a pole in his basement until transfer to the county jail could be arranged or release was ordered. Here is the officer at work near the corner of Route 19 and Fort Couch, where Charlie's place stands today. The change in road conditions and in law enforcement between then and now is evident. The first major new church was built in 1949, Westminster Presbyterian on Route 19. This original structure has expanded several times since then. In the late 1950s, Route 19 grew again to four lanes, and Upper St. Clair was well on its way to its population boom. By the late 1960s, the township's growth required a municipal building. This expanded version arrived in 1968. And in 1976, the township voted to adopt a home rule form of government, under which it has remained. Today, with its shopping malls, corporate office buildings such as the attractive Consolidation Coal Facility, a complete school system, and a population approaching 20,000, it may be hard to believe that Upper St. Clair once hosted Monongahela Indians, Revolutionary War soldiers, whiskey rebels, and coal miners. But it is truly an area rich in history, the history of our country as a whole. And we hope that you, the viewer, will look, visit, feel, and enjoy these mementos that still remain of our community's roots. And furthermore, we hope you will join us in respecting their transitory nature by helping to maintain and protect their beauty and historical value. We live in an old new community, and we hope this program has given you a little more understanding of the people, places, and things, the several St. Clairs that have made our home what it is today.
you would like to view a complete audiovisual program with additional Upper St. Clair details or anecdotes, or visit the Historical Society's History Room at the library, or join the Upper St. Clair Historical Society, simply write to Upper St. Clair Historical Society, care of June Ellington, President, 2672 Monterey Drive, Upper St. Clair, Pennsylvania, 15241. We would appreciate your interest and support. Once again, that address, 2672 Monterey Drive, Upper St. Clair, Pennsylvania, 15241. Attention, June Ellington, President. This has been the presentation of a nonprofit organization and is not intended for commercial use.